group. Um, welcome to this session. My name is Dr. Susan Greenspan. I'm a physician at uh, UPNC University of Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh. I know we've got one Pittsburgher here. Yeah. Oh, more, more. Okay. Um, that's great. And um, I'm actually an endocrinologist and a geriatrician. Um, and I focus a lot on uh, bone loss and bone health in older women, very old, frail women, and actually old, frail men. Um, but I also really enjoy taking care of um, younger and middle-aged people um, all across. So um, this is particularly important and um, to think about how we think about other causes of bone loss so when patients come into your office, you don't automatically assume that it's just osteoporosis and treat them. So before I start, um, any PhDs? Oh, that is great, that is great. The reason this is so great is because um, we now, particularly in Pittsburgh, are really trying to get the um, basic scientists and the clinicians to talk to one another because they do these great studies in mice and rats and they don't, it doesn't always jive with what we're doing with our clinical studies. So we really need to be able to talk and understand and start to get a common language. So what you are doing, which is really important and really neat in the basic science field, we know, you know how to navigate and how to look forward in terms of the clinical. And also you see if, if we are doing something or we need something that, that is clinically relevant, how we can point you in the right direction in terms of basic scientists to, to go that path. So I, I'm really happy that, that you're here. Okay, so these are the objectives, and this is a nice small group, so if you have questions along the way, please feel free to go ahead and ask them. Um, so to, to think about the classification of osteoporosis and the differential diagnosis of low bone mass, because not everyone that has low bone mass or looking like they have osteoporosis actually has it. Understand what laboratory testing to do, when to order, what the results mean, and know what, when we need to think about zebras. Um, you are going to be sent most of the zebras because the primary care physicians um, are now taking care of a lot of patients with low bone mass and osteoporosis. So, but the ones that are not straightforward are the ones that, you're, that, that you are going to get. You'll also get a lot of regular ones that just have osteoporosis, but a lot of the, the very um, difficult patients you will see. So we're going to start right out and do this sort of case-based approach to think about um, you know, patients as, as we go along. This is a 50-year-old woman, five years postmenopausal. She comes in for advice for preventing osteoporosis. She's always been thin. She denies that she has a, an eating disorder, no weight change. She has chronic mild anemia, so she's been on some iron supplements. She has a basal cell cancer uh, on her face removed about six years ago. She uses sunscreen. Uh, she does take a calcium supplement for the last year. She exercises three times a week. Her family history is significant. We just heard about um, Cliff talking about the genetics and how some of that can wind through osteoporosis. Mother and uh, maternal grandmother had hip fractures in their 70s. Is that young, old for hip fracture? Little young, little young. A lot of patients that we see that come into the hospital with Hip fractures, um, when I was uh, before Pittsburgh, when I was in Boston, the average age of patients with hip fractures were about 85 coming into our hospital, so it's a little young. Um, on exam, she looks pretty normal. She's um, 66 inches, no height loss, weighs about 110 pounds. She appears healthy. So the first question comes up, would you screen her for osteoporosis? Because we know overall, about one out of two women in this room, um, and about 20% of men, will have an osteoporotic fracture in their lifetime. So not to you know, pick on this side of the room, but if we were to cut it in half, you, know, you all would be the ones potentially having a fracture. So we can't, we, we would like to screen everyone if we could, but we can't just because of cost, um, the, the cost of these studies. So the question is, how do we decide who to screen? So what do you think about this 50-year-old? She's interested because of this family history. But, you know, sometimes 
people will have a family history, it's not gonna affect them. What do you think? Would, would people screen her? Yeah? Exactly right, exactly right. So she's got multiple reasons um, that we would wanna screen her. And if we look at what the US Preventative Services Task Force came out with last year, these were their guidelines and they did a very evidence-based approach. So in order to, um, to, to get a positive from them, you really have to have good evidence, uh, good trials and studies done. So they found convincing evidence that bone density tests were accurate to detect osteoporosis and predict fractures in women and men. And, and I know Ego said, don't be misled by the bone density. And, and he is correct. The bone density is not the end all. However, it is probably one of the best tools now we have, um, the best tool now we have for screening. So when your patient comes into the clinic and is sitting before you, you may say, or ego may say, it's not the best tool, it can be misleading, but right now it is probably the best that we have. So they found that it was convincing to screen men, uh, to, sorry, to screen women, evidence that drug therapies reduce fracture rates in postmenopausal women, but they found that the evidence was inadequate to assess drug effectiveness in men and therefore screen men. So they said, okay, we're gonna screen women, not so sure about what to do about men. So they recommended screen women over the age of 65 and older to prevent osteoporotic fracture. So that means you can screen anybody. They don't have to have a risk factor. However, when you do the order to get a bone density, it is very important not to write or not to check off screening, okay? If you check off screening, Medicare or insurance will generally um, send it back and not allow the patient to get the test. So you need to find a reason, really important, that you find a reason. But the good news is, it's really easy to find a reason to screen someone for osteoporosis, but you cannot call it screening because there is a box you could check off as, as a screening test, but you don't wanna do that just because you may not get it paid for. Now, they said to screen women who were younger than that, so postmenopausal women who were younger than that, if they would qualify by FRAX, there are a variety of screening tools from questionnaires. Um, one is OST that uses weight and age, one um, OSIRIS using eight wage if they uh, are estrogen deficient, prior fracture, there's another one called SCORE, or if you have these risk, frac risk, risk factors that you think would predispose them to, to screening. And, um, but again, not enough evidence to decide what to do with men, so they didn't support that. So the problem with saying that we can't screen men was then um, followed up very nicely by an editorial um, in JAMA from Jane Cawley. And she said, the problem is that they're really not following what we should do for screening. Because the screening in men is fulfilled by the three criteria that is generally used for screening of anything. So the burden of disease is great. So one out of five or 20% of men will fracture and the mortality of hip fracture in men is higher. It's roughly 30% compared to 25% in women. We have the same tools for men as we have for women, bone density. We use them for both. So that shouldn't uh, detract. And we have efficacious treatments that are readily available. Therapies approved by the FDA for men include bisphosphonates, denosumab, teriparatide. Um, so the target is, was suggested by her, and as we'll show you the other guidelines, um, some other guidelines is to screen men 70 years and older. Um, again, thinking that they are a very high rate for a fracture. And that is just uh, shown here that if you look at hip fracture rates, um, we're looking at women, yep, this works, um, women in the red and men in the blue. For women, they start to go up in the spine about age 65. 
And about five years later, it's parallel for men, but shifted over for about five years. And for hip fracture, it's a little bit later, maybe age 70, starting to, to go up quickly. And again, shifted maybe five to seven years later for men. So, um, and that's where they came up with the 70 year, year guideline. But if you were to go by um, these, the US Preventative Services Task Force guidelines, um, then you would think it's not reasonable to screen, but their reasoning, um, what we feel was, was flawed in several areas, and as I'll show you, there are many different guidelines that still would suggest screening men. So when we screen or when we try and figure out, is this person at risk, we get a, a central DEXA. There's some limitations with the table and the size and if they've had surgery on their back or they have um, uh, metal in their back. But if, but if the central dex is not possible, then any site, at least like a forearm bone density, is better than nothing at all. Um, and forearm bone densities are, are particularly good for primary hyperparathyroidism, where we often see bone loss at the forearm, and for patients that have calcium malabsorption, like our patient that we're looking at, hypercalciuria, uh, kidney disease, where we would see secondary hyperparathyroidism. So we get a bone density and we get a score. Um, here's her or her T score minus 2.7. So the question is, is this postmenopausal osteoporosis? What do you think? Maybe, maybe, but it's possible that she's got a secondary cause. So maybe or maybe not. And again, it only detects the lone bone density. Um, it is up to us to figure out what's the cause because we would like to treat the cause, the underlying cause if we can find it before we start therapy, before we start additional therapy on top of that. Okay, so when we look at this overall di differential diagnosis, um, there's primary osteoporosis, there's secondary caused by other diseases, there's idiopathic if we can't find a reason and it's in a young adult, sometimes we call it that, there are defects in mineralization like osteomalacia, vitamin D deficiency, and defects in collagen synthesis like osteogenesis imperfecta. So all of endocrinology is sort of like you're, you, know, you are looking for the evidence. You're the detective and you are looking for the evidence. And osteoporosis is just another example for that. You know, someone comes in with a problem, with an elevated calcium, and you're trying to figure out before you try and get it down, um, or as you're getting it down, why do they have that elevated calcium? Same thing with the bone density. They have a very low bone density or a history of fracture, and you want to know why they have it before you just treat it with, with drugs. So um, this is in your handout or on your slides. <clears throat> um, this is a list of secondary causes. I'm not going to go through it all, um, but you can see there's lots. There are endocrine disorders, so you'll be very familiar with, with treating those. Um, things that are more common that you would see in endocrine, thyrotoxicosis or Graves' disease or overtreatment with thyroid hormone, hyperprolactinemia. Um, you might see type 1 diabetes and certainly the hyperparathyroidism. Um, the thing that we're looking at here might be malabsorption if we look at the nutritional conditions vitamin D deficiency, calcium deficiency. There are lots of drugs. So the list of drugs just continues to get longer and longer. And that's pretty much true. Whenever you're doing any differential diagnosis for anyone, it's always you know, cancer, infection, drugs, right? When your attending always asks you, what's the differential? It can always be cancer, infection, drugs. And the same thing is true um, with this. There's some uh, unusual disorders of collagen metabolism, and then there's a whole bunch of, of other diseases that don't quite fit um, in, in the right-hand column. Okay, so um, 40 to 60% of men and women who present with a, what appears to be primary osteoporosis have an underlying diagnosis. So that's really the good news for you. It's like you're going on this fishing expedition or, or as a detective, but roughly half of the time, um, you or the primary care physician who sent you the patient will find a secondary cause. And the most common 
by far is vitamin D deficiency. And um, you'll probably hear more about that later, but why vitamin D deficiency? Well, we only get vitamin D from the sun or if we eat it. And um, except for this unusual day in sunny Florida where it's not so sunny, um, we even tell people like, don't go out in the sun because you're gonna get skin cancer and wrinkles or put on SPF 50 and that blocks our ability to make vitamin D. So vitamin D deficiency, very, very common. And what foods have vitamin D in them? Codfish oil, what was? Oil, oily fish, oily fish, codfish oil, not a lot. They're not, I mean, milk has a little bit of vitamin D which is put into it, but there are not a lot of foods that have vitamin D. So unless you, and we are seeing this in many, many older adults that don't wanna go out in the sun because of skin cancer and wrinkles, they're not on a multivitamin, so we are seeing vitamin D deficiency. But the good news is it's really, really easy to treat. Hypercalcuria, malabsorption, maybe our patient has that, hypogonadism in men, and then there are the other endocrine diseases that, that you will see, Cushing's, hyperthyroidism, multiple myeloma, hyperparathyroidism, um, those are less common but still up there as causing osteoporosis or, or low bone mass. Okay, so the question came up um, you know, almost 20 years ago um, and this was a fellow, an endocrine fellow of Dr. Lucky, who used to be part of this program, and they asked the question, um, how do you go about figuring out what tests do you order for someone that you are worried about a secondary cause? So they looked at 664 consecutive postmenopausal women that had a T-score minus 2.5 or lower, um, fi about 50% were excluded because they were referred into their clinic and their PCP said, these are known, this is the known problem of this patient. Um, I want you to sort of fix it, but we already know what it is. So she, they ended up with about 173 um, women ages 46 to 87 without an unknown cause. And so what they did is on all these people, they got a CBC, a chemistry, a 24-hour urine, a PTH, a 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and most had a TSH and serum protein electrophoresis because it always comes up, how many tests do you order? I mean, there's, there's a lot of tests that we could do. When I went through that list of all the causes, you could order many more tests. But, but the thought was, well, let's start with the first row or, or the first tier of tests. So about half or 45% were found to have a secondary cause. Um, vitamin D deficiency, again, was the most common, about 20%. Uh, hypercalcuria, 10%. Malabsorption, 7%. Um, hyperparathyroidism, overreplacement, um, the one patient with Cushing's disease, and, and one other uh, problem. So when we think about T-scores and Z-scores. So what's the difference between a T-score and a Z-score? Anyone know the difference between a T-score and a Z-score? So the T-score is the comparison of your patient to a young population, so a 20 or 30 year old. So you have the 20 or 30 year old bone density is way up here and your patient's is down here and it's the standard deviations below where they were at that peak bone density. And based on epidemiologic data, um, which happened a long time ago by the World Health Organization, used for epidemiologic studies, but now it is used in clinical practice, they came up with this criteria of a T-score and then using minus 2.5 as this magic cutoff for osteoporosis. So that's the T-score. It's where you are at age 30 or 35, depending upon if it's men or women, and looking at how many standard deviations below that you are. A Z-score is how you compare with other people your age. So if you're a 70-year-old, how do you compare with other 70-year-olds? So she may not look so bad compared to other 70-year-olds. She may be, um, have a very low bone density, but compared to her peers, 
she's right up there or she is in the same low area. So uh, we look at z-scores to give us an idea how they compare to their peers. And many have suggested that if you are much lower than your peer or your z-score is lower than minus 2 or minus 1.5, that's a red flag and you really want to think about doing uh, more of a workup for secondary causes of bone loss. So we use it to determine if the bone density is lower than expected for age and it suggests there's a secondary cause, but it's not a definitive uh, diagnosis. And many times we often do this anyway, even without a z-score that is, is very low. But if you have a z-score that is very low, and when you order bone density tests, they give you um, T-scores and Z-scores and pictures and comments, and they tell you what the patient has, so you don't have to remember these numbers. But um, it will help you decide if their Z-score on this paper is very low, then you really want to think about secondary causes. Okay, so all patients deserve at least a limited test, and additional testing is preferred if the Z-score or this comparison to other 70-year-olds or other age match is very low. So why do we even need to confirm a diagnosis? So why couldn't we just treat people anyway? And, and this has always been a question, you know, what's cost effective? Why couldn't we just go ahead and treat everyone with calcium and D and put them on a bisphosphonate? Um, the problem is there are issues with treating patients um, if they have other problems. So if we have someone who has low calcium, so hypocalcemia, malabsorption, and we just put them on a bisphosphonate or a very potent one such as denosumab, um, then we can end up with significant hypocalcemia, which would then end, or they could often end up in the hospital if they get that. And that's a drug, as you'll hear later today, that has a long action. So it's going to last, that drug is once um, every six months. And so you could make them hypocalcemic. Um, we can't treat patients with renal insufficiency or near uh, renal failure with the bisphosphonates. And if they have a skeletal malignancy, so if we have someone that has cancer or has Paget's disease, we don't want to treat them with a bone building agent such as teriparatide or abaloparatide. Okay, so we, we need to sort of, there, there is some reasoning behind this. And it also, our drugs work better if, for example, we treat the vitamin D deficiency and we get them on calcium um, first, or at least at the same time. So when we evaluate our patients, we want to ask them about fractures, bone pain, muscle weakness, have they gained weight, lost weight, GI symptoms, rash, do they have bone tenderness, muscle weakness? Do they look cushionoid? Uh, or could they be hyperthyroid? Do they have a, guider, a goiter? Have they lost height? Do they have kyphoscoliosis and, and height loss? Okay, so these were the things that uh, came up in this study, going back to this study of like, what do we order? The, the chemistry, the CBC, the 24-hour urine, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and thyroid function tests if the, if the patient is older or on thyroxine. And I just want to come back to the 24-hour urine calcium. So how many have ordered a 24-hour urinary calcium? So is it easy to get? No. no. So what happens? It's difficult, so she's exactly right. So you explain it, you give them the pep doc, and they go to the lab and they you know, get the great big gallon of, of container to put the urine in, and they come back to the lab with a container filled with about a cup of urine, right? Because they don't quite understand it or they don't do it appropriately. So that's why we order the creatinine to make sure it's, it's a good. Um, so the question is how many times do you do this? because probably 50% of the time it comes back, um, you know, the sample is too small or they got the jug at one lab that puts 
um, you know, one preservative in it and they bring it back to another lab that doesn't measure it that way and then it comes back undetectable. So how many times do you do that? So I give it, a, I give it one shot. I give it one shot. Um, if I'm really worried that they have, um, th th that they need this, if I'm, if I'm suspecting something else, then I will give it one shot. If I really think it could be hypercalciuria, then I'll give it two shots. But it's not an easy test for patients. So again, um, you do your best, you build it up, tell them it's really important, they go and collect it. Um, and it is important because it will tell you if what they are taking in is enough, so it'll tell you about a malabsorption problem, or are they peeing out too much urine? And it's a really cheap test. And it's not difficult, theoretically, to do, but it does seem to be difficult in, in practice. So generally, um, most of the times, I, I will give it you know, two shots. Do you give it more? Maybe two, maybe two, okay. So um, other tests we, we will do, PTH, testosterone in men, screen for Cushing, celiac, and multiple myeloma. Um, if we are thinking down that road and we don't come up with anything and their bone density is really low or they are fracturing. So um, what are we looking for? Well, if their albumin is low, we're looking for malabsorption, malnutrition. If their globulin is up, we're looking for myeloma or thinking about that. If their ALK-FOS is up, could it be a malignancy, cirrhosis, vitamin D deficiency, calcium up or down, malabsorption or hyperparathyroidism. Their phosphate is up, uh, I'm sorry, uh, down, malnutrition, osteomalacia. You're gonna hear a lot of at this meeting um, because we now have a new drug to treat um, some very rare X-linked hypophosphatemia. Um, these are uh, really interesting patients, but this drug is now, biologic has now been around for about a year. Um, mainly treating kids, but I think some adults are, are now getting it. Um, vitamin D deficiency, and then again, the importance of the 24-hour urinary calcium. And if we see an abnormality in the calcium that is high or low, we can go ahead and get a PTH. If they have anemia um, or we are worried about myeloma, they're an older patient and we see a lot of things that are low, their white count, maybe their platelets, um, then we might think of myeloma and get a urine protein electrophoresis or free light chains. And then if we're thinking about malabsorption in this case, we would think about uh, celiac disease. So it's really important, and if you remember one thing, just one thing from this talk, um, the most important thing to remember is when you order a vitamin D to order a 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So a 25-hydroxy vitamin D, not the 125. The 125 will often be normal most of the time because we will be able to convert the pool of 25-hydroxy vitamin D to 125 vitamin D. So that will be normal in the face of vitamin D deficiency. So you want to look at the 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And as the 25-D declines, the PTH goes up, this increases the 1-alpha-hydroxylase activity, which will convert um, it to 125-D. So the 125-D, again, will be normal when the 25-D is lower. Now, there are ongoing debates, and there's gonna be um, uh, more information at this meeting, um, again, like what is a normal vitamin D level? So we, know, we think or we believe that above 30, is clearly normal, and less than 20 is too low. There's this gray area in between that endocrinologists and others are fighting over between 20 and 30, um, which defines vitamin D deficiency. So we know that 20, it's gotta be at least 20. I think most of us as endocrinology actually push for 30. But we know that if it's less than 20, it's vitamin D deficiency. And lower than that, we often think of as osteomalacia. And this is what osteomalacia um, looks like. And um, you can see norm the bone is in green, and this is unmineralized bone in the red around this little spicule of bone. And osteomalacia is often asymptomatic. Um, people may come in with bone pain, muscle weakness, 
Um, sometimes it, it goes on for a long period of time. They may have these pseudo fractures and complain that they have um, discomfort in their, or achiness, particularly in their thighs where they get these little pseudo fractures. Um, and the elevated PTH may or may not uh, be present depending upon the calcium that they're taking. So really important to try and correct this before we start the anti-resorptive drugs. So again, this is talking about the 24-hour urine. It, it identifies hypercalciuria and malabsorption. Um, both of these are associated with bone loss and fractures. Um, the, the spot urine calcium doesn't tell us about malabsorption. So that's why the 24-hour urine is important. The spot urine only tells you what you were eating right before you had the spot. So you really want the overall 24-hour urine, not just a spot urine, which will tell you, did they have calcium for lunch or did they skip it for breakfast? So generally we suggest that they, they're on about 1,000 milligrams for at least two weeks. We include the creatinine, so we know it's a complete um, collection. The sodium is important. So if we get someone that is really high, what is the first thing that we do? If you get a 24-hour urine calcium that is high. Well, are they on salt? Are they on a high-protein diet? So some of these people that are on high-protein diets, they wanna lose weight. Um, when we get rid of calcium in the urine or when we get rid of salt in the urine, we pull calcium with it. So that will cause hypercalciuria. Um, in it, and then if they're on a diuretic. So certain diuretics like Lasix, the loop diuretics will also pull calcium out of the urine. And then it's not reliable if the creatinine clearance is less than 30. Please. Say it again on? No. What to do with that? I think if you could stop it, you could do it again. But, uh, but um, it, it, it's hard to know. I don't know of studies. I don't know of studies to tell you what that would be. Okay, so the majority of urine um, comes from dietary intake. The intakes are low if they have vitamin D deficiency, GI disease, and we talked about this, high values too much salt, too much um, uh, sodium, too much protein, or too much calcium. So some people that are taking huge doses of calcium, but it can also tell you that uh, they have excess bone resorption, myeloma, bo metastatic bone disease. Um, patients that come into the hospital with acute immobilization, so sometimes you'll have these um, individuals who have been in an automobile accident, have a lot of bone breaks, they're immobilized, and their calcium will, will go uh, up very high. And then um, there are patients that have these idiopathic hypercalciuria, renal calcium leaks. So um, guidelines for prevention. The uh, 2019 um, NOF guidelines, which are almost out, we're supposed to be out by the end of this year, but we are hoping they will be out. We're supposed to get them out by um, ASVMR, and guess what, we're late. Um, but hopefully we will have the, the clinician's guide. Has anyone ever seen the clinician's guide to osteoporosis? Well, this is really a very great handy free guide um, that, that talks all about osteoporosis. It is for physicians or clinician's guide. It's not for the lay public, um, but we are in the process of redoing it. The, the last one um, that was published was about 2013 and then it's been updated but this is a major update, and hopefully that will be out um, early next year. Anyway, these are the recommendations um, similar to what was there before. If you look at the European, the European guidance, um, how to screen, they just suggest a CBC, CHEM, and SED rate to sort of see is there anything overall going on. Um, in the UK, they look at a CBC, CHEM, SED rate, C-reactive protein, and thyroid function test, and in Canada, uh, again, biochemical screening and 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So I think pretty much most of them, or actually, I, I take that back. I was going to say most of them will have the chem profile, the CBC, so they're looking, are they sick? Is their calcium normal? 
Um, but I think that 25D um, is really important, but only Canada and, and the United States have that currently. Okay, so let's go back to Joan. She's been sitting in that office and waiting a long time. Um, her CBC and chemistry are normal. Her TSH and T4 are normal. We get a 24-hour urinary calcium and it's 40. And the 25-hydroxy vitamin D is 16. So what is going on? So this isn't tricky, just what does she have? Yes, so she, malabsorption, so exactly right. So she's got um, uh, low 24-hour urinary calcium, low vitamin D. So she could have some malabsorption um, explaining both of that. So probable calcium, and, and you, I think you said the diagnosis or malabsorption, but what would be the most common one, which would be celiac disease. Um, so the 24-hour urine calcium, um, we, we would see a low 24-hour urinary calcium. She may or may not have symptoms. So a lot of times now in adults, we are actually not seeing specific symptoms of celiac disease. Um, we, we test them by going further and getting the tissue transglutaminase antibody, and then the gold standard is the, is the uh, duodenal biopsy. Now, what happens if you say to the patient, your antibody is low, I think you have celiac disease, you need to be on a gluten-free diet, but I want to send you to a gastroenterologist to biopsy you to make the definitive diagnosis. So she says, okay, or he says, okay, um, goes on a gluten diet and goes to the gastroenterologist and gets a biopsy. It's gonna be normal, it's gonna be normal, okay? So the patient, unfortunately, if you want the definitive diagnosis, they have to continue on their regular diet until they get the GI biopsy, okay? If they go on the gluten-free diet, then it's not worth getting the biopsy because it will be normal. Um, and then we could argue whether or not you really need the definitive diagnosis. If, you, if they, um, the antibody test goes down and you, they're feeling better, or their 24-hour urine um, is better, then again, that's very helpful. But just so you know, we, we remember that, that if they're on the gluten-free diet and they get the biopsy, it is gonna be, or likely to be normal. And this is just showing you what it looks like. Um, normally, you see these, these really nice filaments, and in a patient that has um, celiac disease, there's this atrophy. Um, how common is it? Well. Uh, one, they say about 1% of the United States population, 3% in osteoporosis, many are asymptomatic. Um, when you treat them or get them on the gluten-free diet and um, get them to absorb the calcium, get them on enough vitamin D, they often do better. And um, one of the most significant patients I had when I uh, started in, in Pittsburgh was a lady who was, um, Apparently, uh, an older woman who was very active, taking care of her grandchildren, had a great life, and over a period of about 10 years, function started to go down, go down, go down. She wasn't really complaining of symptoms, but when her sister brought her into the waiting room, or into my office, um, she was in a wheelchair. She had muscle weakness, bone pain. People had said it's psychiatric. They didn't know what was going on with her. Um, she had, I had lost weight, and it turned out, again, celiac disease, vitamin D deficiency. So just getting her on the gluten-free diet, treating her significant vitamin D deficiency, her bone density improved significantly. She was able to, you know, get up and actually walk again. Um, probably one of the most amazing patients that I saw, but she had been, you know, off in, um, a place that didn't have a lot of care for a long time, and so by the time she came to, to see us, um, she was in, in bad shape. But the good news is it's reversible. Please. Um, it took several years, so her bone density did improve. So able to get the calcium and vitamin D in and mineralize all that unmineralized bone. 
So rather than treating her right away, we just did the calcium and vitamin D, and her bone density was going up, you know, three to four percent each year. Finally, the point where, you know, again, I, I now see her maybe every two to three years, and now her bone density is just stable. Um, but she really went from osteoporosis into the normal range. I mean, she was extremely low. But it, it took a while. It didn't happen overnight. And her PTH was very, very high. And that took a while to come down. So the PTH doesn't come down immediately. That took a while for it to come down. Okay, so this is Rose. So we have till 11.05, is that right? Okay, so this is Rose. Her spine T-score minus 2.8. She's had three acute vertebral fractures with minimal trauma. She's been on alendronate for um, uh, about a year. She gets, uh, or we get a CBC, uh, which is a little low. Her white count, a little low. Platelets, a little low. Chemistry, normal. What might you be thinking about? Or what haven't we, what other workup should we do? Malignancy. Okay, absolutely right, malignancy. And what kind of malignancy might you think about someone that's having all these fractures? It could be any malignancy, but one that we can screen for easily. Multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma exactly right. So uh, multiple myeloma, not common. I maybe pick up a few cases of MGUS, which is, may or may not be a precursor of myeloma, and maybe one case of beginning myeloma, or a couple of cases a year. Um, but it drives bone destruction, increases the activity of the osteoclast. They may complain of bone pain, weight loss, anemia. Um, and again, the, the test that we get is the serum and urine immunoelectrophoresis or serum-free light change and light chains, and those are very sensitive. So again, a patient who is doing really well and over a relatively um, short period of time, losing bone density, getting fractures or bone pain, just and, and has an anemia, then think about ordering the next thing down. So again, looking for the zebras. So this is a 62-year-old woman with progressive muscle and bone pain, weakness and fatigue over the past eight years. So she had to give up walking for exercise and most activities doing worsen, due to worsening pain and weakness. And she was now using a motorized wheelchair and walker. She was at the uh, pain center. They thought that it was, you know, either could be psychological or whatever, but she was in so much pain. They were treating her with narcotics, um, anti-epileptics, and she still had um, significant pain. She'd had multiple fractures um, of the humerus, tib, fib, ribs, spine fracture since age 54. So this is something that came on um, relatively suddenly and relatively dramatically. So even though she's getting treated in the pain center with narcotics and whatever, it's real because she's having these fractures. She's not making this up. Um, and you get a DEXA score and uh, hip minus 2.2, spine minus 2.7. Not that bad. Not that bad. So what do you think? So we get the normal labs, right? We're, we have to work her up for secondary causes of bone loss. Her CVC, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, 24-hour urinary calcium are all normal. Her calcium, creatinine, ALKFOS, liver function tests are normal. PTH is normal. <coughs> so these are unusual cases. But if you get someone um, to, if, if you are asked to see someone like this, where there is something going on, and it's happened in a relatively short period of time, so six to eight years, and this person is clearly fracturing, so something is going on and something new has happened. So that's the time when you wanna start ordering um, more tests and thinking about other diseases. Um, so what lab test is missing? Any thoughts? Phosphate. Phosphate, really, really important. So really important when you do the chem screen, a lot of times the chem screen doesn't include the phosphate. 
And this is particularly relevant at this meeting because we now have one of these biologics, um, not to treat this patient, but to treat another group of these patients that can have this. So um, the bone pain and muscle weakness suggests a disease other than osteoporosis. Um, could it be vitamin D deficiency? Could it be a, a type of osteomalacia with low serum phosphorus? Um, and her phosphorus was, was low at 2.1. So I important to measure. Um, she happened to have, again, very, very rare, this tumor-induced osteomalacia and acquired paraneoplastic syndrome um, caused by a small, slow-growing mesenchymal tumor that is producing FGF23, so fibroblast um, growth factor. So this is often missed for years. They're difficult to find. You have to do a PET scan and, again, really hunt, and sometimes you can't pick it up. Um, but what you see is the low serum phosphorus, a normal calcium, normal V, uh, 25D. This is the one time to order a 125 hydroxy vitamin D, which will be low, and this very high um, FGF23, which is blocking the kidney's ability to reabsorb the phosphate. So her serum phosphate is low, her urine phosphate is really high because she is peeing it out, and it blocks the ability to take 25D to 1, to hydroxylate it to get to the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which is why the 125 hydroxy vitamin D is low. But the other way, again, to assess it is if you order the high, if you find the high FGF23. So um, this is a very, very rare case, and you may never see one, but you will um, start to hear more about um, these types of um, osteomalacia, these renal weak osteomalacias, because of the um, FGF, the ability now of a medication which blocks this FGF23. So here's a 55-year-old uh, early menopause woman, strong family history of peripheral fractures. She had some fractures as a child and adolescent, none as an adult. Um, she has bilateral hearing aids, and her routine lab tests are normal. So we want to get some more lab tests. So really important in the exam is to look at the eyes. Now, um, oftentimes you don't see the blue sclera. I don't know if you can appreciate this, because you know there are all these different forms of osteogenesis imperfecta. And even if you send them off to the lab for genetic screening, we're now finding out that there are different alleles and probably more categories than we originally thought about. Um, so you can't always get that diagnosis, but if you get that history of someone having these peripheral fractures and having a family history, it could be the adult form of osteogenesis imperfecta. Now, the good news is, is that we currently treat that as if it is osteoporosis. So we currently treat them with a bisphosphonate. Um, we don't have a lot of good, so this is just talks about um, the childhood fractures, the blue sclera, we only see it in a small portion. Um, the treatment is to prevent postmenopausal age-related bone loss. We don't have a lot of proof in women after menopause, but we have um, some data in, in postmenopausal women, um, uh, I'm sorry, after menopause. We don't have a lot before, but it is also the treatment um, of choice in children, a bisphosphonate. And teriparatide or abaloparatide is appealing. We don't have a lot of data on those. Um, here's a man with multiple fractures um, of the wrist, ribs, right tib, fib, knee. He's otherwise healthy, no steroids, no history of drug abuse, no smoking, regular exercise. You ask about his libido, he says it's normal. His mom had osteoporosis. And there are his T scores and his Z scores. So what do you think he has? So does he have osteoporosis at least by the category? Well, close. When we diagnose it 
by bone density, men under the age of 50, we actually use a Z-score. Okay, so we would use a Z-score for him, and we would see that his Z-score, particularly of his spine, is really low. His total hip is pretty low, and his femoral neck is also pretty low. So we want to do um, additional tests. So what would we think about in a man? Now, he's told us that he has a normal libido. How helpful is that? Not, right? Um, they may not want to go into it. So if you have a male who's presenting with low bone mass or fractures, um, very important to ask the history and do the exam, but also get the testosterone. So um, all this was normal, is 25D, PTH, 24-hour urine. And what would we do with testosterone? The normal, it should say less than, uh, it should be say greater than 200. Um, that's still, um, uh, and sometimes we get free testosterone, as you know, oftentimes you measure it two or three times to make sure that it's correct, but um, not only did he have a low testosterone, he had a low LH and FSH. So what does that tell us? So say again? Yes, yeah, so it's central um, hypogonadism. So what else would we want to do? So it's not testicular, because if it was just testicular, we would see high LHFSH, or we could see that, right? Trying to, to get the level up. But the fact that we see that it's low, it has to be central. So what else would we want to order? Pituitary test, exactly right, and an MRI. And here's his MRI with his prolactinoma. His TSH and growth hormone were normal, ACTH normal, but MRI um, uh, showing the pituitary adenoma. And when you asked him more symptoms, he did have decreased energy, muscle mass, body hair, and a history of infertility. So you can certainly ask those questions to begin with, um, but regardless of the answers, um, really important to get the testosterone. And I think there's one more case, and this is just to make the point that you can do an initial screen and your patient can be doing okay, and then they can stop being okay. And when they stop being okay, you have to rethink, could something else be going on, okay? And now maybe they're not taking the medicine, but something else could be going on. So this is a 34-year-old that had uh, a TAH BSO for endometriosis and was not on hormone therapy. So she had premature menopause, um, estrogen low. So when at the age of 49, when she was seen, she, she didn't want estrogen, she had um, osteoporosis by her spine T-score, and she was put on a variety of different bisphosphonates. She has been on them for many years, and she was not able to tolerate raloxifene, which is a CIRM, um, it made her get hot flashes. So she was on, and, and you'll see this, patients who were on a variety of bisphosphonates, on and off, different ones over the years. So um, at the age of 66, the bisphosphonates were stopped, and she went on uh, teriparatide. So she went on a bone-building agent. And then what happens when teriparatide or abaloparatide are stopped? So you have someone and they're kind of cooking along on their bisphosphonate, not losing bone as, as not building bone as Ego said, but just kind of holding on. And you put them on um, a bone builder, an anabolic like teriparatide or abaloparatide, and their bone density goes up. And then we're only allowed to give it for two years, right? We're only allowed to give it for two years and we have to stop. So what happens if we stop and we don't put them on anything? Exactly right. It's so all that work they did by taking that um, subcutaneous daily injection every day goes down the tube. So what do we have to do to prevent that? We have to start another agent. We have to start, an, and, and many times we will start another bisphosphonate. So she got the residronate again. Okay, so if we look at her bone densities um, going along, we can see that the bisphosphonate's kind of hanging in there, um, not, but had improved a little bit. And then she gets the teriparatide, and it's going from minus 2.8 to minus 1. I'm sorry, she's getting it from here to here. And um, 
I'm, I want to go over here. Sorry. So, so it is. It has improved. That was really the first time it's improved inner spine. It doesn't do much in the hip, as as you know. The anabolics, the teriparatide and a baliparatide improve hip bone density a little bit, but not a lot. But you will hear more about romososumab, which does actually a lot for the hip. But it did improve her, her spine bone density. So she's going from minus 2.8 to minus 2.1, an 11% increase. And then she stops, um, but the teriparatide, she went on residronate and she had this significant loss. Okay, so this is the point again, someone has been on therapy and they're now not doing well. So really important to think about working her up again. So she gets the metabolic panel. She has a normal serum protein electrophoresis. Her celiac test is okay. Her thyroid's okay. What about her 24-hour urinary calcium? It's high. It's high. You know, usually we're thinking around 200. So, so this is a little high. Um, we're, we'll spend just a minute at the very end um, on biochemical markers of bone turnover. We get them. Not really that helpful as biochemical markers often aren't that helpful. Um, the NTX is okay. The osteocalcin is okay. The P1NP um, of 37 is not suppressed. So P1NP is a marker of bone formation, but it should be suppressed if she's on a bisphosphonate, right? Everything should be turned down, but it's not. So what uh, what else are we thinking? Well, let's just look at her numbers. And again, just to look at the bottom line. So this is when she's on no therapy. Her calciums are at the upper limits of normal. Her PTH is at the upper limits of normal. Her vitamin D is normal. And her ionized calcium is just above the upper limits of normal. So what does she have? She has hyperparathyroidism. So again, you can have these patients who are, are having an abnormal response, meaning their calciums are high, but their PTHs, which should be suppressed at that high calcium of 5.7, are actually at the upper limits of normal. So you don't always have to see the parathyroid hormone above the upper limits of normal. And sometimes your surgeons or the people that do um, these uh, scanning tests, as she had, will fight you and say, you have to have both the calcium and the PTH above normal. But here we have a patient, um, again, she, her bone density is going down, her calcium is sitting up a little bit too high, her parathyroid hormone, which should now be suppressed, um, is not, and her ionized calcium is elevated. So here is on her spec CT scan and thyroid ultrasound. Um, she had this area of parathyroid adenoma. Remember, she was someone that got Forteo previously, teriparatide, and did really well. So this is something that came on later, or maybe it was brewing even when she got it, but she did well and we didn't know about it then. But something else was going on, and again, very important to continue to, to work her up. Um, this is just to uh, highlight the point that we have biochemical markers of bone turnover, of bone formation, bone resorption. And do, do you all use them occasionally? So occasionally we get them to see, is the patient really taking the therapy? And we often use them for research, right? You're going to see all kinds of bone markers data at, at the meeting. Um, but there, it's limited in practice. There's a lot of variability. A lot of times they have to get it in the morning, they have to be fasting, but if you get it day after day after day, you'll see it go up, down, up, down. So it's often not that reliable and it often may not be covered by insurance. Many times when we have something going on like this lady that had been doing well and we had screened her all in the beginning, we will get them because we don't know what's going on and maybe it will give us some clue or go along with the diagnosis we're looking for. So they may provide an early indicator that they're not responding to therapy, they're not taking the therapy. Um, they often are not that helpful on anti-resorptives. 
Um, and serum CTX requires standardization, meaning they need to be fasting in the morning, no prior exercise. There's a urine NTX and a serum CTX, so often it's um, easier to have the patient get the serum test, the CTX in the morning, fasting when you're getting some of the other bloods that, that you may want um, fasting. Um, do we do bone biopsies? Has anyone done a bone biopsy? We rarely do bone biopsies. Um, part of it is you have to have someone that does a good bone biopsy and you have to send it to a place. You, you have to label the bone. So, so a patient has to take labeling or tetracycle labeling um, reliably twice. And then you have to have a place that reads them, reads it appropriately. So if we have something that's going on and that we can't explain or we're trying to decide um, it, should we treat them and we have a renal patient, should we, are, are they a high bone turnover or low bone turnover pa patient, that would be the group. The person that you may hear later today, Paul Miller, is an expert on bone biopsies. He does them in his sleep. He doesn't understand why the rest of us don't do them. Um, but whenever I decide, should I do a bone biopsy, I call him. He says, yes, of course do it. Um, but then we have to find like who to send the sample to and, and who to do it. But there are places that do them really well. You just have to find who that is. Okay, so just to summarize, um, I think we've gone over you know, all the causes. Really important to think about sort of a, a, a set of, of tests that you want to do on probably everybody. And then if you can't find what's going on, then to continue to dig a little bit deeper because you are going to get the cases, some of these weird cases or unusual cases um, as, as you are the, the specialist. So any questions? I think we're um, right at the time of your next break before you go to your next. So any, any questions or I can stay around? Please. There are not. That's a really good question. Um, we wish we had such a biomarker, but currently we do not. Please. So I think the thinking of a SED rate is a SED rate, you know, um, is sort of Overall, could anything, like if they have a malignancy, their SED rate would be up. If they have an infection, their SED rate would be up. Um, so I think it's a way to sort of screen for overall wellness. Um, it, that hasn't, wasn't shown to be helpful when that original study was done, which many of our guidelines were based on. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, if you looked at a whole slew of those patients that had, so this patient had hypercalcemia and almost hyperparathyroidism. Um, but you'll also see sometimes normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism where the calcium is upper limits normal, not over, and the PTH is up. But then you have to make sure that that's just not a problem with getting the vitamin D to get the PTH down. Um, but this was the other way around where the calcium was sitting up a little bit higher. The PTH wasn't quite over the normal limit, but it was inadequately suppressed for where it should be. But I, I don't know the answer to those patients have a low bone density. The person who probably would know the answer to that is John Bilzekian. And actually, there's someone who's going to do, I think it's Bart, someone's going to do, I think, a talk on hyperparathyroid disorders in your next session, please. That's a really good question. So uh, treating him, so testosterone is good um, for muscle, but the testosterone is converted to estrogen and it's actually the estrogen that's important for the bone. Um, but if he doesn't have enough testosterone, he's not going to make the estrogen. Um, but again, you will start to see an improvement of 2 to 3% per year. And so following him over time, is, uh, bone is slow. It's not going to happen you know, in the next year or two. You're not going to get them to be normal. But you follow them over time, and their bone density will go up. 
um, he, he, it, it may go up five to seven percent and then just sort of sit there. Please. So pseudo fractures are just little tiny cracks in the bone where you would have to do sort of MRI and see um, edema, like marrow edema, where there is a crack. So we get little cracks all during the day when we walk along. And it's usually here, um, the lateral part of our bone, because this is when you walk, this is the biggest stress. So you get these little tiny fractures or pseudo fractures. But we are pretty good at repairing them. Like um, uh, Ego Seaman said, or was it Ego or, or Cliff said, it was like skin. Bone is like skin. We are very good at repairing it. Skin turns over, bone turns over. We're very good at repairing it. Okay, thank you all very much.